sure. Rel was was chatting with the person who's but who's got the headphones on, so that's that's all I needed to see. Um, so many people walking into the room at right on the time. I'm just going to watch James and wait for him to sit down. <laughs> run, James, run. James is our next speaker, so I'm, I'm glad he's actually in the room in, in advance of the talk. It means I know where, where to look. Um, thank you all for coming back here nice and quickly after lunch. This is indeed the Developers Developers Miniconf at LCA 2018 in Sydney. Yes, that's where we are. we're in Sydney. Um, our first after lunch presenter is the wonderful Donna Benjamin, who's going to be telling us how to uh, turn stories into software. Please make her welcome. Stories transform us. Stories connect us. Stories make us human. I'm going to talk about turning stories into software. I'm Donna Benjamin. Thanks for the introduction, Chris. I am um, a project lead and business analyst at Catalyst IT. But I don't want to talk about me. Hello. Who are you? So I'm making some assumptions. We're at the Developers Developers Miniconf, so I'm assuming most of you are developers. But some of you may not be. Do we have any closet? Scrum masters in the room. What about reluctant product owners? I'm seeing a few, a few brave hands. So hands up if you are, if you do identify as a developer. OK. And how many of you use agile methods? Most of you. How many of you know and have heard and use regularly user stories? Nearly everyone. I, I probably don't need to do this talk. You're probably all experts. All right, so humor me. What is a user story? So given the familiarity, you'll probably find this kind of familiar. As a user, I require so I can, right? Common pattern. Is this crazy talk for anybody? So this is a kind of formulaic template that we use in Agile land to talk about user stories. I want to go a little bit beyond this, though, and go back to the why. <laughs> As a goat, I want a per programmer who can help me out so that the work gets done with multiple perspectives. This follows that formula to the letter. So it's hilarious, right? Goat user stories. If, you, if you're a Twitter person, goat user stories is quite amusing. But where do user stories come from? Where do user stories come from? I want to explore five methods of where I think user stories come from. Um, in a way, user stories are, you know, they're a kind of requirements. They've replaced perhaps more traditional requirements. That I require part of the template is sort of fundamental to what they're all about. But where do they come from and their requirements? So this is where the story, I want to bring the story back in and that the story is listening to users. So how do we do that? Well, one way of kind of eliciting user stories or requirements is workshops. And these are a really great way of bringing the key people together, giving them a chance to brainstorm, to share ideas, to test ideas. You can also prioritise in the moment of what matters. Sticky notes, again, hands up. Who, who is, is the victim of much sticky note business? Yes. Where do they come from? How many of you participate in kickoff meetings that generate those sticky notes? A whole lot less of you. Actually, put your hands up higher, those of you who are. They're, right, that's, that's, I don't know, I'm going to say in the 10 to 20% of you as opposed to the almost 100% of you that put your hands up as developers. 
So where do they come from? Well, workshops is one place where they, where they come from. Interviews is a really good one. This is where you get a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone who really understands the thing that you're building, whatever that might be, to give them a, chan give them a chance to really tell you why they need that thing. Who's heard of the five whys? Yes, a few of you. So, you know, for those of you who, who don't know, this is why you just keep asking why until you get to the real reason why someone wants something. So they say, okay, let's say someone walks into a hardware store and says, I need to buy a drill. Okay, well, you know, here's a drill, here's the five that we've got. Off you go, pick a drill. But do they really want a drill? Probably what they really want is to drill a hole with that drill. It's the thing they want to do with that tool. But they probably don't even really want a hole, right? They probably want to hang a picture or, you know, use a thread something through a conduit. You know, the, you, you keep going until you get to what is it that you're actually trying to achieve, to understand the why behind that. And sometimes it takes a few goes to uncover that. Sometimes you get the situation where someone comes to you saying, I need a thing, and they're actually going through some convoluted workaround to achieve the why that they want. Maybe you can throw away all of that noise and say, well, actually, all you really want is a hammer and a nail. You don't need a drill. Interviews are a good way to really have a chance to have that conversation and uncover that, the depth of that story. Surveys. So workshops and interviews are qualitative data, surveys give you an opportunity to go deeper, to get a broad, sorry, not deeper, but broader, let you ask more people more quickly, perhaps validate some of the information you've got out of your, your workshops and your interviews and your anic data. You want to get some real data, <coughs> hard numbers. Also with surveys, you can, you know, make pretty graphs and competitive analysis, like workshops, interviews, surveys, they all take a lot of effort, um, collaboration with other people and time. Competitive analysis is something you can probably do quickly from your desk. Competitive analysis is that opportunity to um, compare things, look at, a, uh, look at the range of what's out there, see what other people are doing, perhaps test other similar versions of your software that may or may not do similar things, perhaps look at a whole bunch of different websites and see how their, um, how they're managing the information architecture for a particular segment, which is what this spreadsheet is of. I looked at a whole bunch of school websites to kind of see what were the top level things on most of them. Competitive analysis is a good way to kind of get a broader sense of the thing that you're trying to build. And this is actually my favourite. Prototype and iterate. Who's done this? Right? This is huge in open source. Have a go. See if it works. Release early, release often. Release early, release often. Exactly. Sometimes your users don't know what they want until you build something and show it to them. And then they go, yes, or no. So sometimes the iterating is throwing it away and starting it again. But this is a way to really uncover. But more importantly, have that conversation. Hear the story about what it is they want, what it is they're trying to do. Yeah? Prototype and iterate. I don't have a picture for this one. I've got to find a good picture for that. I don't know. Suggestions welcome. So you've had these different methods of gathering these stories, and what you've ended up with is, to use another bit of scrum jargon, epics. You've got these huge stories that you can't possibly deal with. So how do you, how do, you do something with them? This is a sort of mnemonic which I came across, which is really kind of cool. Invest in those stories. Distill them down into something useful. Independent. That they can stand alone, that you can build just that story without it depending on a whole lot of other things. Can you go from beginning to end? Is it independent? Is it negotiable? Can you have a conversation about what is and isn't, about the scope of it, of to what degree? Again, it takes you back to that story, the understanding of the why, getting to the point of how you add value. Is it valuable? Is building this discrete chunk of stuff going to make a difference in any way? Is it actually delivering value? 
to your user, to the project as a whole? Is it meeting the goals of the organisation? Is it valuable? And this is a tricky one. Is it estimable? Can you actually look at how that story is articulated and have a guess at what's going to be involved in building it? Is that even feasible? We get those big stories and we go, oh, I have no idea. So the answer there is no. But can you slice it down into a bit that, hey, you go, yeah, this bit we can, we can get our heads around. We can estimate how long or how much effort it's going to take to build. And small. Ultimately, we want bite-sized chunks. We don't want to eat the whole elephant at once. Make them small and achievable and doable in a human time scale. Like, is this something that's going to fit within a sprint? Or is this something that is going to, you know, just take a day or two and can easily be shuffled around? Small. And that's obviously relative, depending on the nature of your project and the size of your team. But is it, does it fit? And testable. We heard from Benno this morning, a great overview or a reminder of, of unit tests. Is it testable? Can you actually get your head around how you would test it, how you would validate whether or not that thing does what you set out for it to do? Invest. I think it's nice. Who's heard of that one before? No one. Bonus! Oh, no, I got one. OK, thank you. <laughs> I thought it was really a really useful way of kind of uh, thinking about stories and finding that way to break them down from those kind of broad requirement, epic kind of land back into something that we can actually move forward with and turn into software. So for those of you who are familiar with user stories, are you familiar with this book and, and Mike Cohn's work? Okay, no. So this one is one of those, you know, seminal texts of the sort of agile kind of world. And it's really good at sort of taking that broad template, which I think gets thrown away, thrown around sort of willy-nilly, and turned into sort of actionable ways of using user stories effectively for software development. This one's really good. There's another one, though, because I think the danger with user stories is you get so drawn into the detail, into the small, estimable, testable kind of nature of it that you lose sight of the big picture. Right? Are you, anyone, does that resonate with people? You find you're sort of doing on some kind of card or ticket in a system and going, where does this even fit and why? So the big picture um, can be illuminated by story mapping. Story mapping is really useful. And this book, Uses Story Mapping by Jeff Patton, really kind of teases out the whys, hows, and wherefores that story mapping kind of applies. And I really like this picture because you can only just see at the top there's some blue cards. And in this example, the blue cards are actually organisational level goals, strategies. Is everything we're doing actually leading towards those things? And that really brings it back to that sense of value. And you can see where these things fit in the big picture. Really like this stuff. But all of this is very abstract. When it really comes down to the building of software, it's teamwork that matters. Who's familiar with, Tuck, with the Tuckman model of forming, storming, norming, and performing? Just a couple of you. So this is a way about thinking about your group dynamics, about where you actually are as a team. How many of you work in teams on a day-to-day -day basis? Right? Do you sort of sometimes feel like you're just being kind of you know, just in a river of being going along with the flow and you don't have any sort of sense of where you are? At least a few of you are going, yes, yeah, sort of. So this is this um, uh, thinking about your group dynamics, kind of being a little bit abstract and meta about your team can sometimes be really useful because you get to points where you just start feeling a bit of friction because of where you are in the storming, norming, perform. Sto I can't even remember what it is. I need a slide clearly, um, but where you are in that in that journey. When you first come together, you're probably all nice and doing hellos and welcomes and how are yous and getting to know yous, and it's for a very forming stage. Um, you move on and you sort of get to a point where you're kind of jostling for who does what and where, and it gets a bit sort of stressful and, and tense and fractious. And then you get to a point where you all kind of know where you sit and you know what you do, you know who's good at what, and you really start cooking with gas, as they say. And that's your performing phase. Now, that's the, that's the kind of flow, that's the happy place. 
But teams change, people come and go, and so then you go through a sort of either mourning or reforming kind of phase, and the whole thing can cycle around again. But getting to grips with your group dynamics, the how your team works, really helps you take those stories and have better conversations about why you're building stuff. Because it's the telling stories that matter. You have this kind of abstract card as a user, I want, so that. And it's really quite meaningless. It's the conversation that you have with your team, back with your product owner, back with perhaps directly with a client about the why this is building and why it matters and who, it, who it's ultimately going to benefit. Really having that conversation is the thing that matters here, not the words on the card. And estimating effort, this is one of the things I like least. Hands up who loves doing estimating effort. A couple of people, good on you. This is this opportunity to, again, build shared understanding, to have a conversation. It's not about, you know, it's going to take a day or it's going to cost this much, but do we actually understand what we're being asked to build here? That process of estimating effort forces you to do that analysis and build shared understanding. So how do you do that? How do you build shared understanding of these little cards, these stories? Well, another model I'm going to share with you. It's kind of hard to say. It means the habitat. The word is Kinevan. It's a Welsh word. And if there are any Welsh people in the room, I do apologise. Dave Snowden came up with this, and it's a way of thinking about the kind of bigger picture of these stories that we deal with. There's obvious, complicated, complex, and chaotic. And there's another one which the word isn't there, but it's disorder. So let's just go through them. The obvious, or the simple. This is the sort of story you see where you go, I know what that is, I've done it before, I know exactly what's involved, we can do that. It's, you can, we can apply best practice here. They're the easy ones. Complicated. You might need to bring in an expert opinion here. You might need to do a little bit of analysis here. It's a bit more, there's a bit more to it. You know there's some elements you're not quite sure of. There's a little greater level of uncertainty. You're moving on into the complex. And this is where things are really less formalised. You've got a lot more work to do to understand exactly what's coming next. It's much harder to estimate. You might need to do a spike to use some more um, agile jargon to figure out exactly how you might approach it. And then you kind of continue on around that scale to chaotic. And the best way I can describe this is your emergency <laughs> situation. Stuff's on fire, we've just got to put it out, we're going to figure out the details later. The rules, there are no rules because Everything is so fluid and, and chaotic. And then there's the one for which there is no word, disorder. In this case, all bets are off. Probably, you know, there's been a tsunami and you're all like, who knows what's going on. So that model, and I'm just going to go back to it, can Evan, I've found a really good way to get my head around the kinds of stories that I'm dealing with. And I go, where does this fit? And I can have a conversation with my team about where they think it fits. And we get to that sense of shared understanding about the work that we're doing. And also helps figure out within the team, and we know who can do what, whether or not it's familiar or are going to require some outside expertise. So bringing all of this to something more concrete, what are we actually building? Well, I came up with three ideas. Maybe a conference website, a media sharing website, or maybe an app, maybe some little utility, whatever it is, you know, you're building something. What are you building? Who's it for? Do some work on your personas. Um, we're sort of moving past personas a little bit. Some people are starting to talk more about the tasks or the jobs being done rather than the personas, um, rather than the nature of the people doing the thing, talk about the thing they're doing. But I think there's still a role for both. So I went with the conference website. We're all at a conference, right? We all kind of know how they work, hopefully, or we've been victims of them. As a potential delegate, I want to know the date of the conference so that I can see if it suits my schedule for this year. 
who, does that sound like most of you might have been that person at some point or another? Okay, good, good. As a future speaker, hmm, I want to submit a talk proposal so I might be invited to speak at this conference. Well, that worked out well for me this time. Beauty. Um, as a conference organiser, I need to review and evaluate talk proposals so that we can create a good conference program. And now I know there are some serial conference organisers in the room, also seem a bit familiar. So let's drill that down into something very concrete, user roles. Now I've got a couple of examples in Drupal and Django. So in Drupal we have out of the box, we have anonymous users, we have authenticated users and we have admin users. And because I wrote this talk, it all fits together perfectly and they map out, you know, our delegate, our potential speaker and our conference organiser. Here we've got anonymous, authenticated and administrator. Here we've got some of the permissions that they've got. Different levels of uh, permissions. In Django, there's, uh, there's also framework stuff to build on. Now, if you're writing from scratch, you're going to have to think about all of that and how you want to um, address those different users. Maybe you've only got a one user app and this is irrelevant. But I think in the more complex sorts of things we're building, thinking about how those users are actually going to interact with your software at what level should be useful. Yes? No? Crazy? You've all gone to sleep? Okay. So breaking it down even further. As a speaker with an accepted talk, I want to share my talk on social media so that people will come to see it. I did that just before. So social platform logos should appear on every talk page. Now we're getting down into what are the acceptance criteria for this story. Here's perhaps some competitive analysis. Lanyard, rest in peace. There are share, share buttons on that page, kind of like this. This demonstrates the sort of idea that we're talking about. And clicking on each logo should pre-populate a post with the URL and session details, kind of like this. Yep, kind of does the job. So then how do I go about building that? Now, as a Drupal site builder, I'm not writing code. I'm seeing if I can build together like Lego. So is there a component that I can use? Choosing the right contributed modules that do the job. Thankfully, the Drupal Association has done a whole lot of hard work for me and put together a guide of all of the ridiculous number of social media modules that ever exist, and I can sort of see a list of them. And I'm like, how do I pick? So I've gone to, again, some competitive analysis and had a bit of a look around and gone, huh, this one looks good. Let me get into that, like inspect element and see what's being used there. Aha, uh -huh. service links, easy. I've gone through my um, Kinevan model, right, and drilled this down to this is a repeatable, simple pattern. We can do this really easily. That's the service links page. Whenever you sort of make a call in a Drupal module, it's probably similar in other frameworks. When you bring in a tool, have you done some due diligence about how good that tool is? how well used it is, whether the maintainers are kind of sane human beings or people you would not really want to meet in a dark alley, do a little bit of analysis. So, stories. Who of you have read the Agile Manifesto? A few of you. If you have not, please do so. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's on the web so you can read it at any time. But I did distill it down into these four words. People, working together, collaborate, we build things and our products evolve. Stories are at the heart of that work and if we relegate them to some abstract, dry template that we're just ticking boxes, we're never going to get to the heart of the story. So, resonate a little bit, let that sit with you for a little bit and think more about the story next time you're asked to have a conversation about estimating what you're doing. Is there an opportunity to dig a bit deeper and understand the whys? Or maybe you'll cut your scrum masters and product owners a bit of slack and, and let them riff a little bit on where those stories came from and why you're working on them. Bunch of references in my, that are in my slides which I'll post online shortly. Lots of stuff on this, just random searching in your favourite search engine will probably uncover more if you're interested in digging deeper into any of that. Particularly Kinevan and Invest, and if you haven't heard of the other one, it's Smart, 
um, as a, another way of breaking down your user stories. And that's what I've got for you. I was, um, was going to come up with a, a contrived user story to get everybody to applaud, but they did it already. So I guess that makes it obvious. Well done, well done. Yeah, I'll pay that. Uh, so yeah, James is just going to plug in. Uh, and, any questions? Uh, we'll take some questions while he does so. Does anybody have any questions for Donna? Yes. Any questions? It's, yeah. Then, uh, looks no? Like, looks Ten? Like no? Nine? Oh, Hi. one up there? Yes? Uh, yes? No? Hang on, I, I need to run you the microphone so that it gets picked up on the recording. Thanks, Chris. Just on the estimating side of things, have you found any things that uh, make more people love that? <laughs> no, I'd like to talk to you later about how, how you love it so much and what your secret is. Um, estimating, I think, is, is, a, is a tricky thing and it's sort of a necessary evil. I have been kind of following with, you know, just kind of, I wish we, I could go there, the no estimates movement. Um, if you're not familiar with that, that's worth kind of looking up. But yeah, just it's a chore. We have to do it. But I would love to hear how and why you love it and how we spread that joy. Not a good answer. Sorry, Luke. Any others? I'm not seeing any hands up. Three, two, one. Thank I think you. That's it, everybody. Please thank Donna for a wonderful talk.